Aloha. I'm Marsha Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. And today's journey is with, of course, a very special friend. And all of you that have been with me know I only talk to special friends. So, but today we are going to rewind the clock and go back to the very beginning of the Martin Luther King holiday. And so, with that, I want you to meet Alice Talbot, who, in fact, it was her idea to have a holiday. So, Alice, aloha, my dear. Oh, aloha, Marsha. And uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the Martin Luther King Martin holiday Luther. in Hawaii. In Hawaii. Yes. Uh, it was October. I never will forget. <laughs> October. And I had just moved in to this house. I was exhausted and the phone rang. In those days, you know, you had the cord on the phone. <laughs> and it was Alice. And she said, Marsha, Marsha, I just saw Jesse Jackson. And he says Hawaii didn't have a holiday and we must have a holiday. And I thought, oh God, as tired as I was, I said, Alice, you're right, we should. I can't do it, but I'll tell you how. <laughs> so, so that is that conversation, you know, in that minute, that idea was born and it was Alice. So I called Faye. Faye Kennedy. And I said, Alice just called, said, we have to have a Martin Luther King holiday. And she said, that's right. So let's, so we created the friends of the Martin Luther King holiday. And they said, you know, we have to have people of every ethnic group in Hawaii so that this is not a black holiday. So that is in that two or three minutes, that's how all of this began. So Alice, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. And, and it was interesting because, you know, I had been aware that we hadn't, there weren't very many states that did not have a holiday. Hawaii was one of them. This was in the 80s. And um, so, you know, I happened to have, I was new to Hawaii. Uh, I'd come in from the mainland and I'd only been here a couple of years. I didn't know many people. Marsha was one of them. And uh, so I did know a few of the legislators. So I went to uh, the Capitol and I spoke with, at that time it was Leslie Hara. He had, he had just gotten elected and, and I was talking with him and I said, so how come we don't have a holiday? And of course he says to me, well, Alice, this is the thing. It has to be grassroots, grassroots. I remember being a little angry at the time because it seemed to me that they could have just you know, designated a holiday. That's what we have legislators for, seemed to me. Uh, but he said that and I says, okay, all right. At that time, my attitude was like, okay, just hold my beer, let's watch this. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started getting in touch with people. And you know, in, in, in that time, there weren't very many black people here at all. And in terms of uh, statistics, very, very few. And, um, so I knew it wasn't going to be a black holiday, although that's what I heard people say. And I reminded them that it wasn't, Dr. Martin Luther King was not, um, he did things for everybody. Right. And um, that, that, that African Americans in this country were, you know, we were catching it. And, um, so that's where he started, but it, it wasn't a racial thing at all. Yeah, that, and, that um, was in 1986. Yeah, 86. To be exact, to be exact. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so anyway, that's, that's what we did. We got in touch with, we started off with the African-American system, only group I knew, and, uh, but it expanded quite a bit. Oh uh, my, yes. It expanded a lot. It didn't get passed in the first year that we started out. It got passed in the second year. Yeah, second year. But and by that yeah. time, the crowd was enormous. Oh, it was enormous. I, it shocked me. Um, and I remember when it got passed, we were in uh, one of the chambers and it was standing room only. It was packed. And uh, the discussion was, okay, 
we'll have a holiday, but we have so many in Hawaii. You can't just add another one. What are we going to do? So somebody well, says, let's get rid of one. Yeah, well, that was the union. The unions said that, that their contract was limited. And therefore, they were, they were on our side. They want to pass it. But we had to do something to get it to limit it. And because if they open their contract, then who knows what they would lose. So they didn't want to do that. So they were willing. And I was outside and the crowd was mobbed. And I said, well, yeah. why don't we get rid of first of Good Friday? I'm the only Catholic in the bunch. Oh, I almost came away with, just barely came away with my head. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody yeah. was going to give up Good Friday. No. So yeah. they were looking at which holidays to uh, eliminate. And of course, eliminated, um, eliminated Discoverers Day. It was and for Columbus because nobody was there to fight for Well, Columbus. it used to be called Columbus, but, yeah. it, but it's Discoverers Day. Yeah. And I thought, Discover, they didn't discover anything. <laughs> so Discoverers Day was eliminated. So anyway, I uh, got in the elevator, was leaving, and there were, elevator was packed. Oh. And I noticed there were a lot of local people there. So I, I looked up at, at one of the local people and I said, what had you, what had you support this? And he said, Martin Luther King, I'll never forget, he said, Martin Luther King, um, reminded us and had us be proud of our heritage, proud of our, our uh, pigeon, proud of our language, proud of our uh, hula, and, and we're absolutely supporting that. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's what was said. That was the support there. Um, I remember wanting the holiday out of the fact that although I didn't have grandkids at the time, I wanted that whenever I had grandkids, I wanted them to march in a parade for someone who was about peace. So that was my, um, that's what got me going. Besides, which is kind of embarrassing to be living in a state that didn't have a Martin, didn't celebrate Martin Luther King's well, holiday. Now, and the, in, the, in the house, where everything was happening. Mrs. King came to the state to campaign for the holiday. And she was a guest in the House of Representatives. And so she's asking all of these questions about why we don't have a, now, why we don't have a holiday. And she's really, well, you know, she's beautiful and really selling why we should have a holiday. And the Speaker of the House turns to her and says, well, Mrs. King, we don't have very many Negroes. Like, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> like, and everybody in the house just sort of, oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh. Yeah. What's that got to do with it? <laughs> like, we don't have very many. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it did take a while. If you'll remember, Right at the end, the two years, the end, and everybody's on board, and they said, okay, and they're in the conference. And so the big thing was, what is the name? What are we going to call this thing? And um, there was all kind of holidays and holiday for this and holiday for that. And then there's this little voice way in the back of the conference in this crowd. And she says, why don't we call it what it is? Martin Luther King holiday. And everybody said, well, of course. It's like, oh, yeah. And that little voice was Maisie when she was in the house. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, so that's my Maisie story. I, I have to tell it all the time about Maisie. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. And. So those, that's how all of this, and then of course, uh, 
John Wahe'e, mm -hmm. our first Hawaiian governor, was absolutely delighted. He had, he came on board and he was thrilled to sign it. And he has always been a part of the holiday every year since then. Yeah, yeah. It's been amazing. Um, and now looking at it, it's been it's an amazing time we're living in now too. It is today on the television while they were debating, I guess that was a debate on the um, impeachment. I was amazed at how many people quoted Martin Luther King. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. And uh, it was a historic day, but now as we move on, we have, uh, it was the people going to Selma to, to cross the bridge. And we have a picture of, of the people leaving from Hawaii and the lay, as you can see in the pictures. Uh, they were given the lay to take to Selma, boxes of lay from, uh, a, a, a kaka, Reverend Akaka, and the, mm -hmm. the Kaka Foundation donated the lay for them to take to Selma. Well, oh, this one was in the 50s, I think, or 60s, and that's at UH when he was here to speak at UH. I think that's the date on that picture. And that was when he was met at the airport. And of course, you know, we always give lay. But the next one, I think, yes, that's the one. That's the Pettus Bridge. And this is where they're going across the bridge. But this was after, it was the second time across the bridge, after that one where they beat uh, John Lewis so badly. So this one was the next time. And it's, it's amazing, absolutely amazing how far we've come since uh since that idea of yours how far we have come <laughs> oh yeah yeah well you know the other thing is that i don't know if people remember of course at our age it's a, it's a memory but appreciate what it was like during the times of martin luther king you know, what it was actually like. The apartheid in this country was fierce. Oh, yeah. Um, deep, the deep South, we used to call it the deep South, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Florida, you know. Florida. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, the Carolinas, you know. All of those places were so outrageously... We can look back and see how outrageously horrendous it was for people of color to live there. Well, it was it was unbelievable. When I was a child in Baltimore, and the signs were black, were white and colored, mm -hmm. which is the name they called us in those days. And here's the sign over the fountain, water fountain out outside, water fountain. And I'm standing there because it was much, not much higher than me, of course. And I'm standing there turning the water, waiting on it to come colored. I'm waiting on <laughs> it. Because <laughs> you know, I, love, I love crayons and the Crayola box that color. And right. so I'm standing there waiting and I'm turning and turning and waiting on the color, the water to create color. <laughs> come up colors. Right. Yeah. right. I'm like, where's the colors? Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. It was, yeah, it was, it was horrendous it during was those horrendous. times. Yeah. And the courage that it took to do what he did, um, because it was really open season for killing uh, people, you know, uh, black people. It was just oh, yeah. open season. And they didn't have to account for it. Oh, no, they still don't. They, yeah, exactly. Exactly. 
Yeah. Yeah. So um, I just would like, I just, I just like to appreciate, remember, particularly during this time, during the holiday or during his birthday, look back and appreciate what he went through and what courage it took um, for him to, to, you know, lead a movement the way he did. When, um, with the Montgomery bus boycott, and now this is one of those deep, dark secrets that most people don't know about. Um, he, he was elected to head the boycott when, because, and this is, this will tell you the extent, the extent to which white people went. He was new in town and he did not have a mortgage. He didn't have a car payment. He didn't have any of those things that they could take away from him, that they could close a bank account, they could close on a mortgage, they could do all of those things. And they did all the time. That's how they controlled. And so when they said, here's the new preacher in town, we've got to do something. And that was how he was elected because he didn't have those things that they could control. Mm. Yeah. No, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. But well, it makes sense, right? This is yes. this is the way they played the game. Yeah. Um, that was that was just one of the things, one of the many things they did. Right. Right. Yeah. Um. But you so, didn't live, you didn't live in the South, so you don't know. No, I actually was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and there wasn't apartheid there. Uh, well, I could say government sanctioned apartheid. Any apartheid there had to do with where you lived. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, you know, just like in most places, uh, our family lived in uh, uh, neighborhoods that had both races. And I went to school with both races uh, in Pittsburgh. But my mom, who wanted to be able to support the family, her daughters, me and my sister, couldn't get a good job in Pittsburgh. So the government was willing to hire uh, black people. And so she moved to Washington DC to get a job with the government. But she didn't want me to live there because I'd have to go to a segregated school in Washington, D.C., they had schools oh, yeah. for, for uh, Negroes, as we were called then, and whites. And she did not want me to go to a uh, segregated school. So in 1954, when Brown versus Board of Education was passed and schools had to be integrated, I moved to DC. I went through schools where, a school where there was a picket line where the white people didn't want, want us or me to go to that school. I was so naive, Marsha. I didn't, because my family kind of, you know, um, they made sure I didn't, I wasn't exposed to, to that horrible um, racism. So I didn't really know what, why there was, they were picketing. I was <laughs> had to go through the picket lines to get to my classes, but I was rushing through. I didn't read the, the placards. So I, did, I had to ask somebody at school who happened to be a white girl. I said, so why, you know, what is it? Why are they, what, who's picketing? How come they're picketing? And she looked a little embarrassed. And so she told me, I said, well, why don't they want us to go to the school? She said, well, you know, people think that black people aren't as smart as white people. I said, really? Now, I knew that was a lie because I knew very smart black people and very stupid white people. So <laughs> I knew that that wasn't. I said, okay, so really, what is it? And she's mentioned, so well, some people think black people aren't as clean. I knew that was a lie because who cleaned the houses? You know, who was very clean? I went, hmm. If I could just find out why these people are acting like that, 
we could say, okay, whatever we did, apologize and get on with life. That was my attitude. Boy, was I in for a rude awakening. Well, in Baltimore, the home of Nancy Pelosi and all of the Del Sandros, but that's another story. In May, I was sitting in front of the television in one of those little 10 inch televisions that we had in those days. And I saw all this confusion and all of these white women just mad as hell. And that's when they announced that about the Board of Education and that schools would be segregated. So and this is Baltimore. So they interviewed Mrs. Coughlin, who was the principal of the school. And she says, and she's dressed beautiful in the uh, Republican pink suit, you know, the look and the uh, white hair, you, you know, the look. Very, very stylish, very expensive. And she says, I will never see a colored girl graduate from my school. Now her school was Western High School in Baltimore. And it was all girls in Baltimore. They were not only segregated by race, but by gender. And she says, I will never see a girl, colored girl graduate from my school. Colored was what they called us in those days. And so, uh, and, and Western was a high mucky muck school, as you may suspect. So come August, there were five of us that showed up at her school. Uh, and, and again, handpicked. I don't know who picked us, but we were handpicked. Now, so we went through the whole school and honestly, no one ever spoke to me. No one ever shared their lunch with me or sat near me at lunchtime or their notes or anything, nothing. I went through all of that in utter silence, which is, as you know, I talk a lot. But so here we are at the end of this ready for graduation. And it was the first day of June and everybody's ready for graduation. And we do all the nonsense with, you know, this pictures with this uh, yearbook and blah, blah, blah. So now that we're ready for graduation and Mrs. Coughlin, that lovely lady in the pink suit, Mrs. Coughlin turned her face to the wall and died. She never saw a colored girl graduate from her school. What do you mean died? I did. She went to heaven. She dropped dead? She's dead. She, she, she turned her back and dropped dead? I said she turned her face to the wall. That's, this, that's old folks when they leave. Oh, when did she die? Before we graduated, day before we graduated. <laughs> she, never, okay. she never saw, a, and, and I'm the shortest one in the class, so I'm the first one in line, and she never saw a colored girl graduate from her school. Interesting. Oh my. Now, I took yeah. it very personally, and, it, <laughs> and it's only been 60 years, and I still kind of, you know. I'll get over it one day. <laughs> yeah. Not today. <laughs> yeah, right. Wow. We have, a, we have a question here. What impact did King's work have on social justice movement in Hawaii? You want to take that? Well, I wasn't in Hawaii at the time. No, but this was in the 60s. Yeah, that was in the 60s. I wasn't in Hawaii. However, in terms of the holiday, I was told by the person in the elevator that the impact was that the um, Hawaiians or I guess, you know, locals began to feel um, proud of the, more proud of themselves, more empowered. I guess I use the word empowered more empowered to um, appreciate um, their culture. Mm -hmm. That's what I that's what I was told in that elevator. Well, we're, we're just about to run out of time, but I have one more question. 
what needs to be done within the schools and education institute and why uh, more education yeah more telling stories about what really happened and um real quick i gosh i, I didn't know we'd gone that fast um we are down to the end but i want to change the subject here and that is we want to campaign to have dc become a state statehood for dc for washington dc and the the reason that it was not done a hundred years ago because the league of women voters has been campaigning for a hundred years to have dc a state they did not want two black senators from dc that was the whole basis of it and that is the same thing that was told when hawaii was trying to become a state and the woman that told me about it uh, she's Hawaiian, Mark, uh, um, Dolores Martin, and her husband was white, and he's from Alabama, and she was a national committee woman, and it was because of her husband, and he campaigned saying, it won't be a brown state. Trust me, it won't be a brown state, but that was the same crap that the, let the capital, the senators gave for not having Hawaii as a state. Exactly the same thing that they're still doing for DC. So uh, we have a couple of pictures from DC. I hope DC, I District of Columbia. Some people District don't know. District of Columbia, yeah. And they have 72,000 people, but no representation. No, um, and they've been, like I said, campaigning for 100 years for statehood. And what they uh, can do, the schools, is tell the truth. The, for the schools. Look at this. Yeah, well, tell the truth. Tell the truth because the um, the corporation that publishes school textbooks, they there's a lot that isn't told the truth. And you know, when we first started with the overthrow and found out that the textbooks didn't tell the truth about the overthrow, which was amazing how that, you know, they said, oh, the queen gave the land to the, oh, come on. It, it was amazing, you know, so uh, uh, absolutely amazing. So the answer to the question is, you're right, just telling the truth. So if, and there are now a lot of books written by local uh, scholars, and that's where finally people are telling the truth about all of this. Telling, telling the truth and teaching physics teaching children how their government works because this government is a democracy meaning the people have to participate yes. they're teaching children how to participate absolutely how to participate and especially uh when you have like the palace for instance just a tour of the palace tells so much and there's so much history right there right there and there's so much so many people make make great great, great scholars the books the new scholars just enough just great i think we're out of time oh no <laughs> that was so fast but alice thank you so much for spending the time with us well thank you for having me it's just wonderful it is so and for the callers i hope that we got your questions answered. And so join us. You have to write a letter to our senators, tell them to vote for statehood for the District of Columbia. So again, thank you people. We'll see you next time.